I think we'll go ahead and get started uh, because we have an incredibly wonderful and exciting uh, series today. So we'd, we'd like to get started. Uh, hello, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you here. My name is Carol Fult. I'm the provost at Dartmouth, and it's my, my honor to welcome you all to the third annual Student Forum on Global Learning. This is a very special part of Dartmouth College's uh, events honoring Martin Luther King Day. And in fact, of course, it stretches over two weeks and we have an amazing program of events. I'd like to start really by thanking the 2012 Forum planning team. This is an incredible group of people, did collaborative efforts, creative ideas, and worked so hard to bring together people from so many Dar Dartmouth departments, and I think it really shows in, in the program that you're going to participate in today. This particular event is one of our highlights of the whole uh, series. It spotlights individual growth, connection, finding common ground, sharing ideas, and in that way is such a fitting tribute to the celebrations of Martin Luther King. It was 50 years ago on May 23rd, 1962, that Dar Dr. King gave a speech titled Toward Freedom at Dartmouth as part of the iconic Great Issues course, which of course has been carried forward in many traditions, including the Dickey Center and through the Tucker Foundation. With his characteristically powerful language, and I hope you all will read his speech, he talked about communication, understanding, goodwill, but he also talked about racism, about inequality, and about nonviolent protest. It's quite a story, many of you may know it, but he actually planned to come and came to campus first in May 1960. But on the very weekend that he arrived in Hanover, mass rioting began in the South as there were hundreds of freedom riders who were gathering together to protest segregationist policies uh, in southern bus terminals. Of course, they were arriving in Montgomery, Alabama, and where they were met by angry mobs. Many civil rights activists were severely beaten, and Dr. King terminated his trip to Hanover and returned to Alabama, where he resumed leadership of the Freedom Rider movement. It took three more years, but he honored that commitment to come to Dartmouth, and he returned to speak, and that's when he gave that speech. At that time, 50 years ago, the Cuban Missile Crisis was about to begin. James Meredith had become the first African American to enroll at the University of Mississippi. It'd be another decade before women were admitted to Dartmouth as full-time students in 1972, and it'd be another 40 years before Ruth Simmons of Brown University became the first person of color elected as a president of an Ivy League institution, and another nine more years before Dartmouth's own president, Jim Young Kim, became the first male person of color to leave an Ivy League institution. And of course, even now, 50 years later, there still remain major socioeconomic, educational, health, and political inequities between races nationally and internationally. And this, of course, will be discussed by many people in the panels, was addressed by Dean Charlotte Johnson this morning at her talk, and I think will be something that we talk about throughout this period of time. Today, you're gonna to have a chance to see how members of our own community are working so hard to challenge their own thinking about these complicated issues and building a better world. And this can be seen in so many ways. Uh, it, for me, very much like what I saw when I visited Kosovo uh, earlier this year, I come from a dispossessed Albanian family and it was quite a moving time for me to return to Kosovo where I found out about work of our own students who had worked together in this war-torn, primarily Muslim country to work with students from the American University in Kosovo to restore a neglected and abused Jewish cemetery and confront challenging issues like ethnic cleansing and reconciliation. I know it's also like the group from the class of 1957, people who are here with us today, who just returned from a listening tour in Israel and in Palestine. Our students and faculty will talk today about their own experiences and how their experiences with these sorts of issues and questions are making them question things as fundamental as what constitutes character in themselves, in their communities, and the world. 
When Dr. King was here, he said, one of the greatest tragedies of life is that more often men seek to live in monologue rather than dialogue. So I think he'd be very proud <laughs> of the dialogue that our students are here to bring to you today. And following in that great tradition of bringing great thinkers to campus to address great issues that brought Dr. King to us 50 years ago, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce the forum's opening speaker, Daniel Noah Moses, the director of Educators Programs, Seeds for Peace. I think Daniel will tell you about his own first visit to uh, Dartmouth, or to Hanover, but since that time, Daniel Moses has lived and worked with people from around the world in countries such as Armenia, India, and Morocco. He currently lives in Jerusalem, but spends his summers in Maine with Seeds of Peace, which he describes as a greenhouse of public spheres, where people can learn to trust and respect each other while still engaging in that meaningful and powerful dialogue and learning how to make decisions. In a 2009 article for the Christian Science Monitor, Daniel writes that participants in programs like Seeds for Peace go through profound transformations and come to terms with the existence and perspectives of the other side. How fitting for an, honoring, uh, an event honoring Dr. Martin Luther King. In so many ways, the stories that our students will share are pictures of their own transformative learning. And a bit like the leaders and educators that Daniel works with, I think you'll find that our students, too, feel that, they, that these experiences can help them find a sense of reconciliation and open a new way to view themselves and their impact in the world. So this is what we're trying to do today, and we are so absolutely honored and thrilled to start this off by a talk with Daniel. So I'd like to welcome him and have you join me in welcoming Daniel back to Dartmouth. Is this on? Can you hear me? No. No? Well, we can hear you, but it's not on. Okay, well, if you can hear me, it's okay. So um, it is great to be back. Um, the last time I was here actually was in the 1980s in the, during the Cold War, the last days of the Cold War. As a high school student, I went on a bike trip, trip through Dartmouth, through Hanover, and I remember how beautiful it was, and I haven't been <coughs> back since. So I thank all of the people uh, from Dartmouth, uh, and Amy, who was so wonderful in organizing, and Bruce, and the class of 57, and, Everybody who, who has invited me and helped me to come here, thank you very much. Um, and what I'd like to do is, is sort of figure out who we are in the room and just give a little outline of that, and then tell you a little bit about myself and my work, and then connect it to Dr. King, to Martin Luther King, and see what is the connection. Who are all of us here, and what is the work we're doing later on this afternoon? What is the work that I do and, and with Seeds of Peace, and with my colleagues and I? Um, and how does that relate to Dr. King? And before I do that, though, um, how many of you know the Dartmouth motto? I just want to see, by show of hands, who knows the Dartmouth motto? Yeah? Oh, yes. Okay. Good. Um, and how many of you, I just, a show of hands, um, when you were growing up, if you're, or if, when you were young, or if you're still young now, are you worried about, uh, about war and violence and the, the, the future of, 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 of the, the planet based on either overt violence, war, or environmental destruction? How many of you are worried? Okay. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why. Okay. Uh, and how many? Oh. <laughs> um, and how many of you know about Seeds of Peace? Wow. Okay. Very good. Um, so let's just get. I just want to explain a little bit who's in the room, and, and from my perspective. So. Um, first of all, my, my connection to Dartmouth is really through Bruce, Bruce Bernstein here from the class of 1957, who's my stepfather, and also the class of 57 who are all over here in the middle. And um, the connection is that um, I've organized with colleagues of mine from Seeds of Peace uh, two different trips. We call them Seeds of Peace Dartmouth uh, Holy Land Listening Tours. And what we did with those trips is we took and, and they can tell you much. Actually, can the class of 57 who went on those trips raise their hand? So, so you can, uh, uh, later on today, you can ask them about it. We basically um, went all over uh, from Janine to Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv to Hebron, 
um, from, the trips were a little bit different. Each one was a little different. So we, they didn't do exactly the same thing. But from Haifa down to, this, uh, to the south of the, of, of the West Bank um, in the Hebron Hills, and from Janine in the north of the West Bank over to Tel Aviv. And everywhere we went, we met um, Seeds of Peace people. So Seeds, who are the, the graduates of the camp, the, the kids, and delegation leaders, who are the people that I work with, who are educators and, and community leaders. And through that kind of network of friendship, they did things that most people never have the chance to do. Um, you know, most people come on a certain kind of trip. They have a certain perspective. They meet a, a very limited range of people. And they come away with their own ideas kind of stamped with, a, uh, this is the way things are. And what these listening tours did is they met an unusual range of people. They went, for example, to Haddad Village outside of Janine where Israelis can't go because it's Area A. And I don't know if you know how the West Bank is organized, but it's Area A, B, and C. In Area A, Israeli citizens cannot go. Uh, and they wouldn't go anyway because they would be too scared. So they, w they went and had a wonderful time in Janine in a beautiful place with an amusement park next door. Um, and then they had Shabbat dinner in Jerusalem in a place where most Palestinians from the West Bank cannot go unless they get special permission, which is very difficult to get, um, and which very few do. And even if they do get it legally, they wouldn't feel comfortable going to those places in West Jerusalem for a Shabbat dinner. So what the people did with these listening tours what, um, is they, did, they basically jumped worlds. They traversed an emotional geography and a physical geography. They broke through physical constraints, legal constraints that stop other people, and then also the emotional geography, which is just even putting aside what's legal um, and you know the guy with the gun stopping you. Uh, there's also the who, where do you feel safe and where would you go? They traversed both of those things. And, and it was very unusual. And um, I, we need a lot more of those kinds of trips. And Seeds of Peace allows us to do that because it's about building bonds of trust that allow people, you can disagree, but even if you disagree, you can meet people and you can, um, you can tell them you disagree and have a good conversation and respect one another and trust one another. And that's what Seeds of Peace is, is really all about. Um, the other Seeds of Peace connections here, Dan Ettinger in the back, was how long were you a, a, a staff person in New York? Uh, three years. Three years, and and then you were you were a counselor, one summer. So we have uh, another Seas of Peace staff member here, and then I also see you, you were a counselor this past uh, past summer. You came back from China. Oh, okay, so one more counselor, um, and then also this past summer, um, we had Lillian, who is a Dartmouth graduate, was doing a film on on the program that I ran, Second Session, which was called Narratives, Moral Imagination, Educational Action. She's now a uh, film student at NYU. And David Nutt, do any of you know David Nutt? Yeah, okay, huh. So David Nutt, whose grandfather, who is also David Nutt, um, and, and knows many of the people in the class of 57, he and, and Monica, who's also a Dartmouth, uh, I don't know if she graduated or not. She gra so um, they started something called Seas of Peace. And it's a seeds of, seas of peace, like this oh, water. Um, they take seeds, people who have grad, kids who have graduated the Seeds of Peace camp, they take them on a ship, on a, I don't know if it's officially a ship, a boat, uh, a sailboat, a very large sailboat, um, off the coast of, uh, between Maine and Boston. And they live together and they sail together. They learn how to, to cooperate on a sh on, you know, as, as a crew. Um, so they started that program, which will continue. And there are many other Dartmouth connections as well. Eric Tanner, who uh, was a counselor for many years, is also, I think he was president of, of his class at Dartmouth. So lots of connections. And the other connection I see, so I was looking at this. Um, I mean, this is so, so much what we do at Seeds of Peace. And so what you guys, how many of you are giving talks this afternoon? Huh, OK. So the, I mean, those talks, I, I looked at what they're about. And I looked at this, explore the interconnectedness of global issues, engage in solutions to societal problems, question your ability to bring about change. Then I wrote down some of the names. Um, whose business is it? Reassessing the effectiveness of international involvement. And I saw that that was connected to USAID. So I was a uh, chief of party for USAID, what they call cooperative agreement between Seeds of Peace and USAID, and was very involved in the nitty gritty of how the money comes from the US government and how it gets applied on the ground. So, all of these questions, um, global challenges, American dream or American illusion, um, when the personal goes global, it's all very, very connected. Uh, you know, I can see the connection between 
between Dartmouth and what you're doing and what you'll do this afternoon and Seeds of Peace and, and Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, but I, I wasn't sure if that was enough, so I started to do a little research. And I, I read about um, Joan Sloan Dickey. And I read his quotation that said, the world's troubles are your troubles. And then he says, um, well, let's see how to the solutions, quote, rest in your mastering the art and spirit of living with other men, just as human and inhuman as you and I. And I think if we just switch that from men to men and women, we have basically this, a seeds of, what could be a Seeds of Peace motto, too. Um, and I thought it was very interesting to see that he was president of Dartmouth from 1945 to 1970. So when he became president of Dartmouth, Martin Luther King was a teenager. When he left the presidency of Dartmouth, Martin Luther King was dead. Um, and so you, he was president during all of those years of, from Martin Luther King's youth all the way through to after his, to Martin Luther King's death. Um, and I, that's just, and he was also the president, of course, when the class of 57 was here. So that's a good connection. Um, and the other connection I saw, of course, is the motto. That, so who can quote the Dartmouth motto? <laughs> Say it again. And what does it mean? And where is it from? I don't know. So I did a quick Google search. And you can't trust Google so much, but it's, it's probably, it is from a few places in the Bible. I mean, there are kind of um, variations, but the oldest source seems to be Isaiah. Yeah, the book of Isaiah. We thought of Daniel Webster. <laughs> <laughs> so later, when I look at King, at, at Dr. King, and what he says, I mean, he draws a lot from the book of Isaiah. A lot, a lot, a lot. So that's another connection. And as we look in the room and we see all these Seeds of Peace, Dartmouth connections, there was one other person I just wanted to put into the room, and that's Nader, um, who some of you remember. The, the class of 57 people will know Nader. Um, he's a friend of mine. He's a Palestinian... Uh, tour guide and taxi driver. He lives in East Jerusalem, and I've known him since I moved to Jerusalem. Um, and we've worked very closely together, and he's been kind of my trusted, uh, he helps me to go into places like Janine, like Ramallah, like Hebron, and figure out what to do, because he speaks Arabic fluently, and I can trust him absolutely. And without him, I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the work that I've done. Uh, so we've done it together. And he drove me to the airport on my way here, and I told him I was going to see the, um, the people, he was with, with us on the trips. He, he and I organized those trips along with Aaron and Tamar. Um, so I told him what I was doing and I tried to explain what this, what this is all about. Uh, he doesn't know much about American history. He graduated high school, he never went to university. But I explained to him and he has, he's a taxi driver, he has a very nice Mercedes van, seven person Mercedes van. And it, it's right outside of, well not right outside, right inside Jaffa Gate. How many of you have been to Jerusalem? Okay, yeah, so you know Jaffa Gate where you walk in. Um, so J his taxi is right, he has a spot right where you walk in through Jaffa Gate, right across from the tourist information place, um, right before you walk down, down the steps there. And so he's had that place for a long time. I don't think he has any legal title. If any of you are anthropologists, you could look at the anthropology of law and see. It's somehow he just owns it and it's respected, but I don't think there's any title in any Jer Jerusalem municipality office that says Nader owns it, but it's just respected. And all the taxi drivers, if they have a spot like that, it's respected. It's some kind of informal economy of, uh, of, of what exists. And um, so he has that spot, and he was I told him about what, what I was doing here, and he said, oh, interesting. And I told him about Martin Luther King, and I said, so can you make a connection between what, what I'm doing? And, and so he first said, well, I'd love to say hello to everybody. Please give everyone a big hug for me. And then he said, well, this reminds me, the other day, I think it was a couple months ago, actually, he was, um, well, he went to, to park in his spot, and there was someone in the spot, and that person should not have been there. So he told the person very respectfully to please leave, and the person said okay, and he was waiting for that person to leave. And an Israeli police officer came over and started to yell at him in a very angry way and told him that he was going to get a ticket because he was holding up traffic. And he respectfully said, well, but you can see this is my spot. I'm just waiting for the, the person to leave, and then I'm going to go right into my spot. You know me. You know this is my spot, and I'm always here. But she was very angry, and she gave him the ticket. And he respectfully took it, and he talked to her. He tried to explain, but when his explanation didn't work, he just took it, 
Uh, and then there's a place on Israeli tickets where you can write something, you know, to, uh, a comment. So he just wrote, thank you. Um, and, and then he, he, all the people, like there's, it's a kind of like a theater when you walk into uh, Jaffa Gate. Oh, the, the, the taxi drivers are watching all the tourists come through. And you have everybody coming. You have Hasidic Jews in their long you know, coats and, and the peyote. And you have um, sometimes Palestinian men who still are wearing the traditional garb. And you have covered women. And you have um, you know, a whole range of, of humanity walking through there. And so all the taxi drivers were watching. And they said to him, why didn't you scream at her? Why didn't you yell at her? She, uh, and he said, no, uh, I, I, wanted to, she, I want to treat her well. And she'll, she'll under, uh, I want to teach her something. I'm going to treat her well. The next day, she, uh, she came over to Nader. And she said, I'm really sorry. I had a terrible day yesterday. I a, a lot of terrible things happened to me. And I let it out on you. And I shouldn't have given you the ticket. I'm really, I apologize. And I was thinking about it because you were so nice. You didn't yell at me. Um, and, and, and that got me. And I started to really think about it. And I, I wish I didn't give you the ticket, but now it's too late. And from that point on, they've become very friendly, he said. And I asked Nader, I said, please think about how what you did, that kind of respect that you showed, how could that be um, projected out in a larger way? And so my another takeaway, if I was now going to write on the board, what else uh, do we need? What, what are the connections? Um, well, know where you're, I mean, between Seeds of Peace and Martin Luther King and what we're doing today, I would say, one, know where you come from. So like that Dartmouth quotation is a great way to, to start. It's a great way to just start looking into why were the founders of Dartmouth choose a quota that quotation from Isaiah. So, and, uh, so that's number one. Two, theory and practice. Oh, what's going to happen this afternoon, from what I understand and from what I've read, it's a lot of you, work that you've done on the ground, and then you've, you've taken theory. So you're combining theory and practice. So theory and practice, know where you're coming from, and respect. And those three things combine seeds of peace, Martin Luther King, and what we're doing today. Um, so now let me tell you a little bit about myself, and, and we'll sort of deepen the, the connection. Um, let's see, where would I start? So I grew up in, uh, in the very last days of the Cold War. And I, I remember you know, when I was in sixth grade, I think it was sixth, maybe it was fifth grade, we, there was a film called The Day After. Does anyone remember that film? Um, so it, it was a film about life after uh, a nuclear attack, a nuclear annihilation. So the Soviet Union and the United States go to war, and the United States is basically decimated. And it's about human beings, Americans, living after this nuclear annihilation. And I remember watching that film in elementary school, and and being worried about it, thinking, is this real? I mean, should I be concerned? Um, but then, a couple of years later, actually maybe, I don't know, from that time I was in sixth grade, let's say, and then when I was in high school, I was asked um, to, to give a talk at the American, East, no, the Eastern Group Psychotherapy Association. So it's a group of psychotherapists. This is in the mid-'80s, and they were worried because the arms race was building up. Ronald Reagan was calling the Soviet Union an, even, an evil empire. It was Reagan and Gorbachev. It was before things started to really, before you could see peace, there was a kind of heating up of, of, of a, a potential for war, it looked like. So the psychotherapists were worried about the impact that the threat of war might have on young people. So I got up, and they had asked me to come and speak. And I said, I don't really think about it. I don't really think about nuclear war. I don't really think about nuclear annihilation. I'm much more concerned about what I'm going to do on a Friday night. And they didn't like that because they thought young people should really be thinking about these threats. <laughs> but I didn't think about it very much, except that once I gave the talk, I did start thinking about it. <laughs> and I did start to worry. And I started to think about this kind of race that we're having between technological progress, and technolo technological innovation, and our ability to live together. And that, to me, became a, a, a central theme. Here we are. We, we can do so much technologically. And we can do things that our grandparents and great-grandparents would have thought was magic. I mean, look at the iPad. It's like magic. And yet, we don't have ways to live together. And because we, are, we have so much power, we better learn to live together. That became the theme that I, I was very interested in. So I, I went to get a PhD in, in American history. And I, I then, while I was finishing that PhD in, in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York, I went to Yerevan, Armenia. And I lived there, and I taught in a program. 
I, I applied to go anywhere in the former Soviet Union because I wanted to see the people who had been my enemy. And so I ended up teaching at a university in Armenia, and all of my colleagues were people who would have been my enemies. They, the, the missiles were going from Armenia to Turkey when Turkey was an American ally and, Ar and Armenia was part of the Soviet Union. And they were very nice people, and we would go walking on Sundays, and I had a great time. I loved Armenia. And while I was there, I started to take Armenian students to meet their Azerbaijani counterparts in, in Tbilisi, Georgia, because Tbilisi was considered neutral ground. And Armenia and Azerbaijan are at war. There, there, there's a, uh, it's, they're still, it's a frozen conflict. So these, these um, university students, 19, 20-year-old students, would come up with me, and the Armenian students would say, literally, on the train up to Tbilisi, we want to meet these people, but please don't let us sleep with them. Don't make us sleep in the same room with them, because they might kill us in the middle of the night. They really believed that, and they would say certain things, and then I would meet the Azerbaijanis who would tell me the same thing about the Armenians. And I became really interested in this, how do you, meet, how do you bring people together who have such radically different ideas, where one person says, he's, this person is my hero, the other person says, this person is my villain. Everything's upside down. One person says, this is my celebration, the other person says, that celebration is what I'm, I am mourning. Um, how, how do you bring these people together when one says it's night and one says it's day? It's an educational challenge. So I started to get in, in, involved in it, and, and then I met at the Pantomime Theater in Yerevan, uh, somebody by the name of Bella, and she had been involved with Seeds of Peace. And before she had been involved with Seeds of Peace, she was Armenian. She had been involved with bringing Armenian and Azerbaijani students together. So she told me about Seeds of Peace. At that point, I was leaving Yerevan, and I said, I want to I go to Seeds of Peace. So I, ap I applied. They, they rejected me. And I, I pushed, I really pushed hard. And this is a lesson that I, I pushed hard. And next thing you know, I, I started working summers for the Adult Educators Program, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, but, but that persistence was great, because a lot of people write emails or, or send uh, letters. And then if they get a rejection, they say, oh, well, they rejected me. But this was the first time in my life where I really didn't take no for, I didn't know what, I, they said no. And I said, I didn't hear you. I, I, I'm, I'm coming. Um, so, so I went up to camp, and, and that started my, this new path. Meanwhile, I, was t I, I got a job, a position teaching as a lecturer on social studies at Harvard. And that's a, a great program. Bec it's great because it looks at human beings in a very interdisciplinary way. So we have, in that program, sociologists, anthropologists, philosophers, historians, um, economists, and we all gather together to try to understand human beings in a more holistic way. So we're not just looking at, you know, economists think that we're all profit maximizers. And anthropologists think that we're all culture makers. And so everyone's coming with their little slice of reality. In social studies, we looked at people and we were able to look at human beings and at social phenomenon in a way that was very whole, very holistic. And I loved it. And the course began with Kant, what is enlightenment, and it ended with, with Habermas the German philosopher Habermas, who uh, basically, as, as a young man, he was uh, a member of the Hitler Youth Group. And as he grew older, he became a kind of defender of, of democracy, of the hopes of the Enlightenment, the idea that we actually can figure out ways to reason together and to get along. And for me, that was a continuation of what I had learned in graduate school. For me, in graduate school, it was John Dewey, because I was studying American intellectual history. And then, as in social studies, I added Habermas. And for me, Seeds of Peace, and this is the theory and practice angle, is really a test of the ideas of John Dewey and, and Habermas. It's an, att an attempt to see, is, it, is democracy possible? And if it's possible, what kind of education do we need to have democracy? What would that look like? Instead of just talking about it at the university, Seeds of Peace gives me a chance to really see it in, in the concrete, tangible way, day to day. How many of you have read Habermas? I'm How many of you have read Dewey? Okay. So does it make, I, I, I would love to talk later. Do you see the connection between what I'm doing with, with why Dewey and Habermas and Seeds of Peace? What's the connection? And also this afternoon, I look forward to hearing what kinds of connections you make between the theory that you read about and, and the work that you do on the ground. So just to give you a sense of what I do at, with Seeds of Peace, uh, Dan would tell you about the seeds. So the buses arrive, 
And the seeds go in one direction. I take the older people. And we have a, an intense three-week session for the older people. These are community leaders. These are educators. They have dialogue. They get to know each other. It's very, very difficult for many of them. And then they go back uh, home. And in 2006, I, I went back to their homes. I, I, I moved to Jerusalem and started to do follow-up programs for them. So I work at camp every summer with the adults. And then I go to Jerusalem, and I'm building a program for these adult educators in their home communities, whether it's Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, but not really. We have very few programs, and the United States. So that was 2006. I moved to, to Jerusalem. And I'm testing, testing this idea of seeds of peace, seeing if democracy can work. And it's exactly what, what you said before. I see seeds of peace as a greenhouse for public spheres, as a place where people can learn the skills necessary to engage with one another in, in a way that, where they can use, they can listen to one another's needs, they can listen to one another's assumptions, they can express their own selves, they can have critical thinking and also a kind of um, an emotional experience that allows them to have a direct learning beyond what you learn in, media, uh, in the media and beyond what you learn on television, I mean, television, media, or in school. So forget what you learn in school, forget what you learn on television and through, through newspapers and other things that you look at, and, and directly learn. Learn from one another. Is it possible? And what would it look like? And what kind of skills do you need? So that's what I've been doing. And just so you know, Seeds of Peace, besides I work in Jerusalem, and I work often in the international arena. But Seeds of Peace does the same stuff, the same exact methods for domestic American concerns. So we have a program for Maine, the state of Maine. And we have the children of, uh, of refugees and immigrants and rural white Mainers who have been in Maine a long time. And there's a lot of uh, there's, there's conflict in Maine because there are a lot of Sudanese refugees and other refugees who are being settled there. And the same kind of process, the same kind of experience, the same kind of education that we use with Israelis and Palestinians, we use with, with Mainers. It's the same work. So now uh, we've talked a little bit about my work. I, now I want to just look at King and then uh, leave it for questions and, and discussion. And I, I looked at King, and I, I, was, I, started to, I did a lot of research. This coming here actually gave me a chance to, to watch his speeches which I've watched many times before, but every time I, I watch them and listen to them, I'm just so amazed and impressed. And I'm also just impressed that, he's, that he died so young and did so much. And, and, his, and his eloquence was just incredible. So I, I've listened to the speeches, and the, the quotation actually that Amy sent to me, many, I guess it was a few months ago, she, she sent me the quotation, this is it, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And then I continued on. Now, here's something else from the I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. That's right out of Isaiah, just like the Dartmouth quotation. So he used a lot of Isaiah, but what, what struck me, especially because I live in Jerusalem, is not only the, the I Have a Dream speech and the other speeches I looked at, but also the, the last speech that he gave, which is the, the mountaintop speech. Because in the mountaintop speech, he does something which is actually extremely audacious. Um, he puts himself in the role of Moses. And he says he's Moses. You know, he doesn't say, I am Moses, but he's putting himself in, in the role of Moses looking across at the promised land. Because if you, if you remember in the Bible, Moses doesn't get to the promised land. He looks out after 40 years in the wilderness. The people have been walking for 40 years in, in the wilderness because, at, at least according to some interpretations, the people who had been born into slavery couldn't get to the promised land. We needed a new generation who had been educated, who had grew up in freedom to get to the promised land. So Moses is... He gets very close, and he gets to the mountaintop, and he looks out at the promised land, but he doesn't get there. And that's what King is putting himself. He's putting himself in that position. 
And to me, that's, that's a very, what is he, he's saying, I don't know what will happen to me, he's saying, but I, I've seen the future. I see what can be. So to me, this connects to a story, th this story of the Exodus. It's basically the Exodus story. It connects very much to, some of you might have read a book by Michael Walzer called Exodus and Revolution. Have any of you read it? No? Okay. So he talks about it, but it's not only from him that I get this. He says, one of the great political metaphors that we can use when we, when we make social change when it, is to say, look, wherever you are, it's, you're, in, you're in Egypt or you're walking, or you've left Egypt. And wherever you are, you're walking to the promised land. And you might not get there. You're, you're still walking. And there are all sorts of enticements to get back to there are the flesh pots of Egypt. Many of the people wanted to go back. Um, and there's the golden calf. And there's temptation everywhere. Well, you have to just keep walking. And what I find so interesting is if you look at King, he talks about Moses, but then he talks about Isaiah. Isaiah is speaking years, generations later. So what Moses looked at was it didn't happened the way he wanted. Things had gone wrong by the time Isaiah is speaking. But Isaiah reimagines. And he reimagines a future. After Moses has looked out to the promised land, now we have Isaiah generations later looking to the promised land, not the promised land, but looking to a better future. Um, and that's the kind of prophetic tradition that King is part of, which is all about inspiring us and giving us imagination. So another thing I would put down as something so important for the work of Seeds of Peace and the work that you do this afternoon and, and the work th that well, of Martin Luther King, is the moral imagination, is, is the prophetic tradition and the moral imagination. But what I find living in Jerusalem, is Jerusalem's not only a metaphor, it's a real city. And it's a difficult city. And, and I get very sad when I see all these metaphors that come down to the ground, and it's not nice. It's, it's violent, it's upsetting. People are, instead of sharing and looking and using these metaphors, which are, can be so inspiring, people are fighting over real places and causing a lot of trouble. My friend Nabil, who some of the Dartmouth 57 uh, members met, he, he's a devout Muslim, and he says, and he's the principal of a school in East Jerusalem. He says, God could have put the holy places all over. He could have put the mosque, uh, Al-Aqsa in, who knows, somewhere in Egypt, and he could have put the Kotel, the, holy, the, the wall in, uh, in France. He could, have put, he could have spread them out, and people would have been able to share, but no. He put them all within a few feet of each other. You can walk from one place to the other. And according to Nabil, this is an, a challenge to us as human beings to see if we can work it out. It's the ultimate challenge that, from his perspective, that God has, has kind of given us a puzzle to see, can we do it? And if we can do it, we can figure out all the environmental problems, and we can figure out all the other problems in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Armenia, in Azerbaijan. But, so this is like the ultimate challenge, and all the eyes are looking at Jerusalem, and it's a potentially amazing educational moment. Because if we can solve things in Jerusalem, it will overflow that little city, which is not really, when you come to think of it, it's not even a very big city. It's a, it's the metropolitan area is, uh, uh, the city is about 800,000 people. It's not even that big. But it, it can overflow. It has, whatever happens there has world historical significance. And then I think about King. And I'm just going to bring us back to King. And, and I looked, it turns out that in his last talk, he talks about his trip from Jericho to Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem. He was in the Holy Land somewhere between 67 and 68 when he died. At least that's what it looks like from the talk because he, it must have been after the 67 war because he's driving from Jericho to Jerusalem. And he tells the story about the Good Samaritan. And he says, well, he, he has a lot of respect and empathy for the, the, the Kohen, the priest, and the Levite. They, they pass the person by, you know, the, the person who has been robbed. They just go by. And King says, well, maybe they were scared because his experience driving from Jericho up to Jerusalem showed him it's a very forbidding place. It's a desert. You're going to the lowest point of the, of, on earth up to a, a hilly city. And it's, it's hot. It's desert. You can get hurt there. It's, it's, it's not an easy place to navigate. It would have been harder back in the days of, of um, well, when the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. And so King empathizes with the Kohen and the Levite. He says, I understand why they didn't do anything. But then he talks about the Good Samaritan. And he says, and it's interesting, he uses Martin Buber. He actually uses the words I and thou. So that's another example of theory and practice. He's quoting Martin Buber. And he says that he's talking about the concern 
about his brother, that the Good Samaritan worried about these other people, this other person. The Good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question, what will happen to me? He switched it. He said, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And then King talks about how they have to help the sanitation workers. And uh, he then ends by saying, and this is the famous, you know, longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And he died the next day. So he, he talks about his trip to Jerusalem, and he uses this metaphor, and, and he takes his experience on the ground, and instead of using it as something to create hate or division, he humanizes, he has empathy for the Kohen and the Levite, but then he says, be like the Good Samaritan and have concern for your other. It's a wonderful ending. And then he t takes the position of Moses at the mountaintop, and he finishes. Um, so my, my last sort of thoughts about this, and here I, I've been, the class of, of 57, when, when you were here at Dartmouth, what a different country it was. Uh, if we had gone down to the south, we would have blacks and whites and separate, going to separate bathrooms, separate schools, separate water fountains. I watched uh, Remember the Titans last week, and it, it's amazing to me that, that that film portrays events that took place actually within my lifetime. So, so, so much has changed. And I've been thinking about that. On Saturday, was it Saturday night? Today's, on Saturday night, I was walking to my friend Pius's house. I was in Portland, Maine, getting ready for, for, uh, ready for the summer. I'm trying to interview staff and think about what we're going to do. Um, and I fell. I, I tripped on the ice, hit my head, went back. And I, when I stood up, there was blood dripping down my head, like lots of blood. And so I went over. I, I was just on my way to Pius's. I said, Pius, I have a problem. He opened the door. In the end, we went to the hospital. And we, we spent like five hours in the Portland hospital. And everything was fine, except if, my, if I've been a little if any of my words have crossed today, it's because I hit my head. And I, I noticed in some of my emails I was writing things that I didn't mean to write. I don't know if that's why. But Pius is from, is from Ghana. So Ghana is the country where, of course, the boys went when he gave up on America, if any of you know that story. And so uh, Pius went from Ghana to America. He's been in Portland, Maine for 10 years. And it's amazing. He's the president, not the president, he, he's the, uh, on the board of the local YMCA. He has started his own organization. It's an interfaith alliance. He's a devout Muslim. He brings Christians, Jews, Hindus, others together. Um, he's also, he's now going to school, and he's, he works with Seeds of Peace a lot. He's actually, today, he did the major, the biggest celebration for Martin Luther King in the state of Maine. He organized it. He's been in Portland for 10 years. And... So it's just an amazing story. When I, when I think of him, I also think of Will Smith, um, who is the, the associate director of Seeds of Peace, who will tell stories about his father who served, he's African American, he served in a segregated unit in World War II, and he tells this story to the Palestinians, to the Israelis, and he tells his own personal story, and it resonates very much with, with them. Tim Wilson, uh, just so you know, Seeds of Peace, when it was started, John Wallach, the founder, called up Tim Wilson, who was the director of a Jewish boys' camp. And that's the camp where John Wallach's children had gone. Tim Wilson was African-American, is an African-American. He was one of the first uh, African-American counselors in a white camp back in the 60s. The owner of that camp, which is now Seeds of Peace, ch wanted to, uh, to integrate the camps and looked for uh, somebody like Tim. And Tim did. He did come. And he's been involved with that camp. And he's been involved in Maine politics ever since. So when I look at Tim, who, and he's around the same age as the Dartmouth 57ers, a little bit younger, and then I look at, at Pius and at Will, I think we've, we've done so much. There's real progress. And I, I think that things that seem permanent can change. So the Soviet Union collapsed. I grew up thinking it was there forever. It collapsed. Last year, there was a fruit seller in Tunisia who set himself on fire. Next thing you know, look what happens. Mubarak, a, a little over a year ago, looked like he was going to be leader of Egypt for who knows how long. Gone. Finished. I was walking in lower Manhattan uh, in September, and I noticed some demonstrators, just a few demonstrators. That was the beginning of Occupy Wall Street. There were just a few people there. So 
things that seem as if they're going to last forever don't last forever. And I, I, when I look at everyone streaming and tweeting and posting and blogging, I, I, and all this technology, these iPads, I think to myself, wow, look at technology. Look at um, what amazing things we do. But my question is, how can we figure out better ways to live together? And I think that we need more places like Seeds of Peace, uh, places where, that create, that nurture public spheres, that, that encourage democracy. And I believe that, that it's very much connected to the work that you're going to do this afternoon, and, that I, and I'm looking forward to listening. And now I just want to distill everything that, that I just said. And this I'm going to look at. I'll look at my notes a little. First of all, what do we need? We need to explore your traditions. Who are you? So the, the Dartmouth model is a good place to start, maybe. And then know who you are and reach out to the world. So be a, a, a global citizen. Another term which uh, the philosopher Anthony Appiah uses, be a rooted cosmopolitan. Be someone rooted in your tradition and reach out as a citizen of the world. I would also say be tenacious. Keep walking in the desert. And King was definitely tenacious. Also be, treat others with respect. And Nader is a great example, and King is a great example, to treat someone with respect even if they're not treating you with respect. Enlarge your scope of empathy. So try to have empathy for other people. And one of the things I think Seeds of Peace does so well, you might not change your political ideas, but if you start caring about somebody, even if you completely disagree with them politically, that's something. So how do you enlarge the scope of empathy? And then the imagination. So what King did when he looked out at the mountaintop, that was really an attempt to spark our imagination. He saw what was not so possible for most people, which seemed out of the realm of possibility. But now it's real. And, and the reality is not always as exactly perfect like we thought it would be. But look, one example, we have an African-American president right now, something that would have been very, very unlikely or beyond the realm of most people's imagination in 1968. So we need all of these things. And the other thing that we need, and, th and this is something I look forward to doing more of this afternoon, is we need theory and practice. So we need theory and practice that combines a thirst for justice and active engagement in the world. So thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Stan, uh, what you do, uh, what you're doing is threatening extremists on both sides. I've worked in the region, and it's, it's not the, always a safe place to work. What steps do you take to, uh, when you're on the street, when you go to see people, do you, are there certain steps you take to reassure them that, that you're not a threat? Do you make eye contact? Do you make, sh uh, right. make it clear you don't have a weapon? How do you handle that? Um, well, it's interesting. When Caesar of Peace was created, John Wallach had his focus on the kids, on the seeds. The program that I run is a kind of response to the questions that you're, that you, the question that you just asked. Because as an American organization, we can't just go into places, whether it's Janine or Tel Aviv or Mumbai or Lahore, and say, hey, we're Seas of Peace. We want to take your kids. They, Seas, of Peace, <laughs> Seas of Peace can be a Zionist conspiracy. It could be a left-wing pro-Palestinian conspiracy. And what we need are people on the ground who have authority and influence in their communities who stand up and say, they're OK. They're halal. They're kosher. You know? and, and, that's what, and it's not so easy sometimes. So on the Israeli side, we work with the ministry right now. On the Palestinian side, we don't right now. Hopefully, we will again, and we did in the past. And everywhere, it's different. And every, every place, we rely on local people in different formats. So on the Egyptian side, it's very interesting. Most of our people are from the upper crust of Egyptian society. If Egypt, if Egypt really changes, it's going to be a challenge for us to meet the new uh, the people who have authority as Egypt changes. Right now, are are many of the people we've worked with are people who have had authority in the Mubarak regime. So, but we work with people on the ground who give, basically give us cover, who are able to stand up and say, don't worry, these guys are OK. So I, I'll do workshops, for example, in Janine, where many of the 57 people went. And after we do a workshop that meets the needs of educators for their own schools and communities, they might be totally against these of peace, the new people. We'll bring some of our older people, our veterans, will get up and say, look, you just learned about how to do communication skills in your own schools. I want to tell you how this fits with the larger mission that we have at Seeds of Peace. You don't have to send your kids to, to the camp to meet Israelis, but we see a connection here. And so we're giving you this service and these skills. You can use them as you want. 
But we also do this bigger thing. And if it's a principal of a school from a refugee camp in the West Bank, his word means a hell of a lot more than mine. how holistic and how um, big of a scope uh, your mission actually has in the world. I've, uh, I've, I'm a former UWC student, and I believe uh, there is at least one former UWC student in this room, Sanella. For, um, she might be here. Um, I've uh, worked for two years in Bosnia Herzegovina, more specifically the southern part that uh, is scarred by um, the Bosnian War of 1990s, and uh, uh, we collaborated closely with the OSCE, uh, the Organization for Social Change in Bosnia and Herzegovina. That was actually uh, that is actually a grassroots organization uh, founded by uh, the Americans. In fact, that um, endeavors to um, employ local people um, in the entire social change that could sort of foster uh, social and economic and political change in that um, part where uh, Bosnians, uh, Bosniaks, in fact, the Muslim part is, is confronted with the Christian part. So I can sort of see how closely your, the situation in Jerusalem mirrors um, the exact scenario that's taking place and it is still um, present and still, in fact, uh, highly represented in Bosnia Herzegovina. So um, I personally worked, um, I try to connect to people with science, so I use scientific experiments in kindergarten to sort of start um, social change from early on. I was especially interested in education and um, teaching kids in general, so I, I uh, try to use science rather than democracy or de rather than uh, social advocacy. But still, I, I um, did uh, sort of uh, try to do that by uh, employing scientific experiments. And it's just one other way of, uh, of finding a global perspective on, um, on that would sort of connect people uh, of various religions or, um, yeah. <laughs> well, it connects, uh, we, we've done a lot of work with, we would call what you do, uh, Workshops on critical thinking, for example. Mm -hmm. And we could do workshops on critical thinking and then see how do we take those skills of critical thinking and then apply them to social questions. Uh, because it's the same, you know, once you start cultivating critical thinking, it can be placed in other places. Also, we, uh, we used to work with, with seeds and, and delegation leaders from the former Yugoslavia. So we used to have a program. I would ask a very simple question of how do we convince our president that communication, which he started with, is the solution to our world's problems rather than fighting? What, you're, what you've talked about is absolutely true. And <laughs> uh, I, do people hear me? Basically, what I'm saying is how do we convince our president to, on how can you do that? Can you make this kind of a presentation <laughs> to him, perhaps? that communication and talking is the solution to our world's problems, not fighting. Uh, I mean, from what I've heard, President Obama, he does say that. Uh, he's, he he's does say that. But so he's I don't know. influenced yeah. by a lot of militarists yeah. that say, we've got to put threats on. I'm, I'm scared to death about Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we should be talking to them. Well, for me, my question would be, what are the limits I think dialogue is very, very important. And I think we need many, many attempts to bring people together, like Seeds of Peace. And just an interesting thing, John Wallach, before he did Seeds of Peace, he tried to bring Soviets and Americans together back in the 80s. Uh, so I think dialogue is very important. There are limits to dialogue. At a certain point, sometimes violence is necessary. Where that line is is something to talk about. Um, maybe I'll take um, Daniel, can you, I, I sit here as a parent. And, and I think about these children coming together. Can you just talk a bit about that element of what happens in these first moments when these two children, for, when these two groups of children come together from diametrically opposed sure. philosophies and cultures and backgrounds? Well, Dan saw things more in the bunks with the kids. So Dan might have things to say specifically about the seeds. I can tell you from the delegation leader perspective, I'll give you a few stories. I, there's a woman, Sumaya, who some of the class of 57 met, the second trip met her. Uh, she was a short woman in Ramallah that we had lunch with. She, when she first came to camp, she's a professor of health sciences at the university 
in, uh, at Al-Quds University outside of Jerusalem. She got to camp, and she saw we placed her in a room with an Israeli woman. And, the, and she came over to me, and she said, Daniel, I can't do it. You have to move me. You have to. And I said, I'm sorry. We can't. Uh, and she said, I, ca I cannot sleep in a room with that woman. I will not do it. I'm not doing it. And she, she was really angry. And I had to sit with her for about 30 minutes and say, look, try it for tonight. And if it doesn't work, we'll see what we can do. It ended up being fine. But she, and she, they became friends. But she was very, very nervous and scared, just like the Armenian kids going up to, to Tbilisi. The idea of sleeping next to someone she thinks of as her enemy was just deeply uncomfortable for her. And the kids have the same kinds of experiences. Would you say that, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to uh, cut us off, not because the questions aren't interesting, but because um, we have a very full program. If you can join me in helping thank Daniel uh, and Carol for their time this morning. And I believe you're uh, joining us yes, for a bit I'll of the here. day. So yeah. hopefully you'll, you'll take opportunity to, to bend Daniel's ear and, and continue to ask questions. I invite you all to join us upstairs. There are four concurrent sessions that will run over the next several blocks, and lunch will be served in the rooms just up above us. Um, follow the signage, and, and please join us and make a day of it. We hope you'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you throughout uh, the afternoon. Thanks so much.